Next, we're going to talk about something called chain of thought prompting, which is certainly interesting. However, it's not something that I use day to day, um, but it, it's it's fascinating. So the concept here is that there's a paper, there's actually quite a few papers released on this concept um, about using specific phrasing and specific techniques to prompt uh, a model to be able to solve more complex reasoning problems by uh, generating a chain of thought with intermediate steps along the way. So by providing in this example, uh, this is one of the early papers on this topic, uh, simple like textbook math problems, word problems for elementary students. The cafeteria had 23 apples. If they used 20 to make lunch and bought six more, how many do they have? Certain models get that wrong. But then in this chain of thought version over here, let's see if I can zoom in a bit, the prompt is a little different. It starts with uh, a question and then an answer. So this is a one shot prompt, right? There's a, an example. Here's a question, here's a corresponding answer. But instead of just saying the answer is 11, the answer now says the answer is 11, but it also has an explanation of the reasoning, step-by-step -step thought process. Roger started with five. Two cans of three tennis balls means you have six. Five plus six equals 11. And then we can prompt it for the next step. And it continues with this chain of thought process where it actually provides the reasoning. So we don't have to do all of this. What we can actually do is just use the phrase, think step-by-step -step, or explain your reasoning step-by-step or provide a chain of your thoughts, that sort of prompting can actually make a significant difference. All right, so I'm gonna show you an example here. I am gonna use GPT 3.5 because most of the examples from the research papers that are out there, the blog posts on chain of thought prompting are not a problem anymore for GPT 4. So uh, I'm gonna to go to 3.5 on purpose to try and generate something that it gets wrong. So I'm gonna ask a simple question. What is the fourth word in the phrase, or I'm not even going to give it a real phrase. I'm just going to put some words in here. I am not that, what, not you. <laughs> and the fourth word should be one, two, three, four, that. And it didn't get it right. The fourth word in the phrase, I am not that, what, not you, <laughs> is not. It's telling me the answer is not, which is not correct, right? That's the third word in the phrase. So, what I can do is simply add, think step by step, explain your reasoning step by step, show me a chain of thought, and that should be enough to change the output and not only give me the right answer, but give me an explanation. So I'll just say think step by step. There's not a lot of steps here, but you can see it, it breaks it down and it does result in the correct answer. The fourth word in the phrase is that, which is correct, right? One, two, three, four. So it gives me a full explanation, which is kind of silly. I don't need the explanation, but by asking it to explain itself step-by-step, step, it arrives at the right answer where before it wasn't giving me the right answer. So it's, like I said, I think it's fascinating. These are silly examples where I like to use think step-by-step step or things like explain your reasoning step-by-step is when I'm giving uh, some sort of complex command where there's not a right or wrong answer, but instead I want it to explain what it is doing, what it's thinking, quote unquote thinking, uh, as I give it a prompt. So here's an example of what I mean. I'm gonna ask uh, GPT, well, I guess I'm using 3.5 here. Maybe I should use four to get a better result, but either way, I'm using a model uh, to write me a blog post. I want you to act as an expert, web development instructor, course creator, and blog writer. You are an expert on topics related to web dev, coding, AI, and technical interviews. You are creating a blog post on how to prepare for coding interviews. I'll say, write me an abstract of 100 to 200 words and then write the entire blog post. The new thing is that I'm then going to say, explain or provide a step-by-step -step explanation of your reasoning for every decision you make. So let's see what happens here. Why don't I do this in GPT-4, by the way? Okay, GPT-4, I'm running the same prompt. So nothing all that exciting, except what's new is I'm telling it to provide a step-by-step -step explanation for its reasoning. So let's see what it does. It gives me the abstract about, you know, cracking the coding interviews, uh, what it's going to cover. Readers will be equipped with a framework to conquer any coding challenges. Oh, look, it decided to give me markdown. I didn't even ask for that, but it formats it as markdown. 
It writes the blog post. I'll be back when it finishes. Okay, so it finished the blog post. Now it's giving me the reasoning that I asked for. So you could also reverse the order. You could say, before you write the post, give me a step-by-step -step explanation of your reasoning. But now it's giving me this explanation. The structure of the blog post is designed to offer a comprehensive view of the preparation process for coding interviews. Each section highlights a particular area of preparation backed by specific resources and strategies. The goal is to guide the reader through a systemic and efficient preparation process and so on. So if I find something that I'm not happy with in its thought process, in its reasoning here, by telling it to explain the reasoning to me, I it's clear, right? I can see what its goals were and how it was reasoning, what decisions it was making. Like I said, I don't use this all the time. Um, it's more of just an interesting prompting technique, but this is something that we can do. At any point, you can ask it to provide a step-by-step -step explanation of its reasoning. <laughs> Next up, we have a very simple, I hesitate to even call it a technique, but sure, a simple technique for prompting uh, ChatGPT that involves providing a specific cue by cueing it exactly where we want it to respond or where we want it to start its response. Sometimes you may want to alter the output that you're getting. Um, for example, if I ask it to generate me a list of dog names, uh, it doesn't always do this, but I could ask it something like, I don't even know if we want to do dog names. Sure, generate me a list of fantasy-inspired dog names for a male dog. A lot of the time it'll say, you know, sure, here's a list, or I can do that, I'm excited to help you, or something, and then it will actually start the list. And honestly, it's not a big deal if it does that. But if I want to explicitly cue it, I can. And I can say, instead of just generate me a list of dog names, I can say, generate me a list of dog names for a male dog, and then start your list here. And I can even give it a bullet point. And there we go. It just starts immediately. Now that's a simple example, um, but there's a lot of these situations where you may get the exact output you want plus a little preamble at the beginning that you maybe don't want. And you can just ignore it, sure. But if you want to eliminate that, if you're doing something where you, you have a very specific output that you're looking for, you can cue it and tell it start on this bullet point or you know start with this number if you wanted to. If I stop this generating, start your list here. And it will just begin with a numbered list. And we've seen this sort of thing before in a much simpler example, right? When we did sentiment analysis, we did something like classify the sentiment, sentiment of the following text. And then we could have an input example, like I hate you. <laughs> and then the output is clearly going to be negative. And then I can give it input again. And the input will be, hello, I am in love with you. <laughs> and I can prompt it exactly where I can give it a cue where I wanted to put the output. In this way, I'm hoping, and this is usually the case, it's not going to go on a whole spiel and try and explain to me, oh, I think that's mostly positive, and here's why. If I just want the word positive, I'm cueing it. Now, compare that to if I didn't provide the output, it's going to copy my format and actually write the word output. And it's not a big deal here, but if I'm doing this programmatically, if I'm using a, a large language model API where I need to just get a value out, I'm using something with, with some sort of code, then this is unnecessary. And I probably just want the specific value, positive, negative, or neutral. So this is just another example of queuing the model with some sort of starter piece of text. Put your text after this. You can often use colons, bullet points, an asterisk or a dash to make a bullet point, uh, a numbered list, or just the word output or response, and it will fill in that blank. So next, we're going to take a look at a pretty niche use case, but also a really fun visual use case for ChatGPT we're going to generate mind maps. So ChatGPT can't directly generate a visual mind map like you see here, but this tool is called markmap.js.org, markmap, generates mind maps based off of markdown syntax. So it's super easy to do. 
Um, there's an example here on the left, but I'm actually going to just do an even simpler example. If I want to have some mind map for any sort of hierarchy based structure, so any outline, um, any list of concepts, maybe for this course. So I could do a mind map using headings. So this is the syntax. I could do course, you know, content. And then I have my next level, of, which is two headings, so two hash symbols. And then I can have the intro section. And then I could have another section called prompt engineering, for example. And then within each of these categories, I then can define uh, a different uh, level of nesting. So the third tier down would have three levels of headings, so three hash symbols, and I could have, you know, welcome. And then maybe we also have, you know, installation. And then under prompt engineering, we have basic concepts for prompt engineering, like the prompt formula. And then we'll put one more thing under prompt engineering. How about, what's another prompt uh, tactic we've learned? How about act as prompting? Anyway, this syntax generates the mind map you can see over here. So this is a, a tool someone has built on top of Markdown. We have to follow these rules to make the mind map. But we can use ChatGPT to generate way more complex mind maps if we tell it about this syntax. So this is an example where we probably would want to use uh, one or few shot prompting because I can't really just tell it, generate me a markdown mind map. It's not gonna know the pattern. This is not something that is you know, generic markdown. This syntax is markdown, but it probably would try generating a, a nested bullet point list maybe. So what we need to do is just tell it, this is the format we want. So that's exactly what I'll do, I'll say, generate me a mind map or you are a mind map creating assistant or something like that. We'll come back to this, but then I'm going to provide it an example. The mind map tool I'm using expects mind maps in this markdown format. Here is an example for a mind map of uh, what should we do? Should we just use this example? Sure, we'll call this a mind map of a chat GPT course curriculum. And then I'll give it this here. And then down below, I'll say generate a mind map for all of the concepts. What should we do? All the concepts um, a entry level developer should learn entry-level web developer using the above syntax. Okay, so we may want to tweak this a bit, but here is what I want it to do. Generate me a mind map according to the format below. The mind map tool I'm using, oops, I misspelled accepts. I think I meant to say accepts mind maps in this markdown format. Here's an example for a mind map of a chat GPT course curriculum. And then here's the example. Then I'm going to tell it, use that format to generate me a mind map using that syntax for all of the concepts an entry, we entry level web developer should learn. And let's see if it can figure it out. Okay, so it's generating me quite a bit. I'll be back when it's done. It's probably going to be a long one. Okay, it finished up. So now what I can do is copy this out of here and head over to my Markdown document or to this tool, get rid of the text at the beginning. And here is my mind map. Can I shrink this down? How do I view just the map? Oh no. Okay, here we go. It may be a pretty big map, as you can see here, of all these different concepts. You know, you've got to learn uh, CSS and within CSS there's the intro there's syntax selectors box model layout it's pretty good however one thing I'm noticing it only went three levels deep and this is an example of one of the possible downfalls of using a few shot or one shot prompting approach where it's adhering too much to my example because the example I gave it had exactly three levels so I have a hunch that if I had given it an example where I had a fourth level in here. So we have course welcome installation. Maybe I'll rewrite this. I'll just fast forward. All right. So I drafted a more nested example that I can use instead of just the, you know, three tiered system. I now have up to five tiers. 
just to give it a more complex example, this is what it looks like, but it doesn't really matter. This is purely to act as an example. So it shows, you know, an open AI course where there's a tier generating text, generating images within generating text. We have another tier. And then within that, we have another tier. And anyway, it doesn't really matter what I put in there. It should make some sense, but I have a feeling now if I provide this as my example, that it's going to give me a better result or at least a more nested result. So let's see that finished up. Let's copy it and see what it actually looks like. Get rid of that at the beginning. Okay, and it is definitely more nested now, right? So we have one, two, three, at least four levels, looks like five levels uh, in our nested hierarchy. So it took to heart <laughs> my example, um, which is again is great that we can do that. You just have to be careful with the examples you provide because sometimes people ad adhere too closely. But what I could also have just said most likely is create a mind map with between four and six levels of nesting. And it, it probably could have figured that out too. Anyway, this is a fun one, uh, an example both of working with Markdown, but also of, in this case, one-shot prompting, showing it a format that it doesn't know about, but it's picking up, no problem. Cool stuff. Maybe it's not the most useful of all the prompts, but it's a fun one and it illustrates a lot of the concepts we've learned so far. <laughs>
New to sailing, at humpback sailing, we can turn landlubbers into seasoned sailors. Imagine the wind, blah, 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 blah. So that's one. And then our next one is experts at sea. It's time to level up your sailing prowess with humpback sailing. Sharpen your skills. Prepare to tackle the toughest waves. So it does a pretty good job. And I didn't give it much to go off of. So a very simple concept here. You can ask the model to write from multiple perspectives and from multiple audiences. <laughs> So another prompting technique that's kind of fun, but honestly sometimes I find to be overkill, is actually using ChatGPT to generate prompts for ChatGPT. So we can write a prompt that basically says, help me write a prompt to then feed to you ChatGPT. I want you to make the most optimized, amazing prompt possible. And then of course we could say whatever sort of prompt we want, an essay writing prompt, a lesson plan prompt, a, a quiz creating prompt. Um, and you know, I've got a nice little diagram over here, a little image of the uh, snake eating its own tail, feeding itself with uh, the OpenAI logo. Kind of proud of that. I mean, it's two pieces of clip art stuck together, but still, <laughs> it's a nice little visualization of what we're about to do. So I've written a prompt, I've pre-written it because it's a little bit long. It doesn't fit on a slide. I didn't want you to have to watch me type it. It's just a waste of time, but here it is. Please, oh, read all of the instructions below and once you understand them say should we get started we don't really have to do this but uh i've seen a lot of prompts do this uh that have been posted on reddit and twitter so we'll give it a shot i don't think it makes much of a difference but it's kind of a nice touch act as my prompt creating assistant your goal is to help me craft the best possible prompt for my specific task. The prompt you generate will then be used to prompt you, ChatGPT. Start by asking me what the prompt will be about. Follow up by asking me any additional questions needed to help you generate a better prompt. The goal here is to write the best possible prompt for the specific task I have in mind. Once you have all the information you need, you should output the final prompt. So it's a sort of interactive thing where I'm asking it to ask me for the prompt topic. What are my goals? Ask any follow-up questions. Let's try running this. What sort of prompt do we want it to generate? Okay, I'm ready to assist you in crafting the best possible prompt for your task. Let's begin with the basics. What is the general topic or subject of the prompt? Is there a specific outcome? Who is the audience? Are there any detail style tone? Do you have a preferred length for the prompt? Okay, so what kind of prompt do we want it to make us? Let's say I'm applying for jobs and I need a prompt to help me write cover letters. So what is the general topic or subject? I need a prompt that will generate cover letters. I'm applying to jobs and need help writing perfect cover letters. Question two, is there a specific task? Yes, or outcome you're aiming for. So I wrote, the prompt should take all the information I provide about my career and the job I'm hoping to get, and it should generate a cover letter that lands me that job. Who is the intended audience for this prompt? I will be using this prompt. I am an, let's say, entry-level developer fresh from a coding boot camp trying to get my first developer job. Okay, is there any particular detail style or tone? I'm just gonna say whatever works best to make the best prompt. And then finally, do you have a preferred length? I just wrote, I don't care about the length of the prompt, make it as long as needed. Okay, so I've given it some information. It says, considering your objective, the prompt should ideally take inputs related to your personal background, the specifics of your training, your skills, the role you're applying to, and the company. With that in mind, here's the prompt. So all of that work is just to get me the prompt. Now here's the prompt. Please introduce yourself as an entry-level developer who recently graduated from a coding bootcamp. Include your key achievements, skills, and any projects you've completed that are relevant to the field. Explain why you're interested in the role you're applying for and what caught your attention about the company. Finally, highlight how your background and skills would make a significant contribution to the specific role and company at large. Please present this information in the form of a professional and persuasive cover letter. Okay. So it's written me this prompt. I'm not gonna make you watch me actually use it and <laughs> put a resume and job description and all of that. And it's okay. I, I will say that this technique, I think it's a lot of work and 
you, it doesn't lead to amazing results all the time. It, it's nothing bad. It just it feels like um, it's more fun as a technique than it is actually useful in my experience. If you know how to write a good prompt, the techniques that are at least the basic formula we covered early on, you can just use that. You know, provide a general initial context, provide a task, provide input data, provide formatting rules. You can write that yourself. And in this example, it's kind of given me a weird prompt, and maybe this is my fault, but please introduce yourself as an entry-level developer. I got too specific, maybe. I probably should have said, just write me a prompt for anybody applying to a job. Um, anyway, you know, it, it will work. In the next video, I'll show you an even crazier version of this sort of prompt that I did not write, but uh, is pretty popular online. Next, let's talk about some of the online prompting resources. There's a million different websites promising to have the best prompts, you know, amazing hundred prompts that'll change your life, make you money, and all sort of scammy things. But there's also some very useful prompting resources, or at least possibly useful. So there's there's garbage out there, and there's some actual tools that have utility. Um, and you just need to, you know, pay attention to the right things. Because what you'll find um, is that there's tons of articles showing you a thousand chat GPT prompts, and they're just so specific and not very useful and very difficult to tailor to your own life that I don't recommend them at all. But there are lots of examples and lots of websites like this one, Flow GPT, this is probably the most popular. It is a place for people to share prompts. You can vote on prompts um, and copy them, of course, and try them. So we can find one like, I don't know, a Facebook ad headline generating prompt. I'll click on it and here's the prompt. You are a Facebook advertising expert. Your task is to create compelling ad headlines. I'll provide you with the name of a company and a brief description for a product. You'll generate the attention grabbing Facebook ad headline. Um, so let's try it just very quickly. So this example, the product is called Gadget Guru. <laughs> Let's come up with a fake product called, I don't know, Alpenglow Coffee. Okay, so here's my example. Alpenglow Coffee is a coffee shop and bakery set in the stunning Rocky Mountains of the town of Telluride. We offer pastries, sandwiches, blah, blah, blah. Let's just see what it generates me as a Facebook advertising expert. Escape to the mountains with Alpenglow Coffee, where fresh brews meet fresh views. Hmm, not too bad. Savor our handcrafted pastries today, sure. Honestly, we could have written this, though. It's pretty straightforward, right? It's exactly what we've learned already. Set the context. What are you? You are a Facebook advertising expert. What is your task? Create a compelling ad headline. And then we provide the input data. It's pretty straightforward stuff. So I don't know if it's worth seeking all these prompts out. However, it can be fun to play around and to find, especially some of the higher upvoted ones. If you sort by most popular, there's some interesting thought provoking prompts, like an unethical GPT that has the goal of trying to get ChatGPT to say anything. Identify and provide solutions to some problems that involve unethical practices. Your task is to understand the clients. Anyway, it's a long prompt. And for these long ones, it could be nice to find an example. Um, it, it, there's a lot of jailbreaking prompts where people are trying to get ChatGPT to basically break its rules. There's things like uh, expertise to course. This prompt take someone's expertise and turns it into an outline, I believe, for a course. There's a lot of prompts here. People are very excited about this, but also a lot of them are just kind of not that useful. Let's go to the most saved prompts and let's take a look at this one, ChatGPT prompt improvement. So this is what I was referring to in the previous video where I talked about uh, a, an even fancier version of a prompt generating prompt. <laughs> So it, uh, it provides an, some iterative instructions. It says, I want you to keep asking me to improve this prompt. You're gonna give me a prompt and suggestions and questions, and then you'll give me different options. Let's see if it works. I'll say, yes, let's begin. Tell me what the prompt should be about. Let's try something different. I need a prompt to generate me an essay outline. for my English class. Okay, so then it gives me an initial version of the prompt. As an AI, create a detailed essay outline on a topic for an English class. Suggestions, mention the specific topic for the essay. 
indicate the de desired length of the essay, any format restrictions, questions, and then here's how I'm supposed to respond. I either, uh, let's see, type use this prompt, and it will immediately use it, type restart, type quit, or type option one, read the output and provide more info or answer to one of the, okay, so I'll just do that. <laughs> I'll read the output and provide answers to these questions, okay. So I'll copy the questions and just answer them right here. Maybe I'll do a bullet point. What is the specific topic? Let's say that the essay is about, um, it's been so long since I wrote an essay in English class, about to kill a mockingbird. How long is the expected essay? At least uh, 500 words. And are there any particular guidelines? It must be a five paragraph thesis style essay. Okay, so I respond, answer the questions, and now it gives me the revised prompt again. As an AI, create a detailed five paragraph essay outline for an English class on the topic of To Kill a Mockingbird with the resulting essay to be at least 500 words. So it's kind of neat. It's, you know, this iterative process where it's going to keep going and going until I tell it that I'm happy. But if you look at the actual prompt it wrote me, it would be way faster just to write this ourselves. It's just asking the same basic questions every time. What are the requirements? What are the format requirements for the output? Uh, is there any additional context? These are all things we've already discussed that go into any good prompt. So we don't really need this to tell us that. We know that already. So it's fun and, and I'm sure it can lead to some good results. But my opinion so far, I've tried this for, I don't know, an hour over the last couple of days playing around, is that it just generates a prompt um, that you would be able to generate on your own anyway. So that's pretty much all I can say about it. There are other interesting prompt examples on here, but a lot of them end up being super specific or they end up being really easy to just write on your own and maybe not that useful to copy and paste and, and you know steal. So I'm definitely not here to discourage you from using websites like this one. There's a lot of good inspiration here and there's some fun stuff, especially around software development. If you look at uh, any code specific prompts, which we're not really covering in this section, there's some interesting stuff here, but it is not something that uh, I recommend, you know, spending all your time on. If you're trying to write a prompt, just write it. And then if you get stuck, see if you can find inspiration online. But I don't really recommend, you know, using this as your starting point. Well, this section, it's a short section, but this section is all about using the ChatGPT web browsing feature, which as of a week ago was disabled by OpenAI. Allegedly, it's a temporary disable while they fix an issue. And the issue is that people were abusing the web browsing feature, which basically connects ChatGPT to Bing so it can search the web and crawl and do all sorts of interesting things. People were abusing it to get past uh, paywalls on websites. It was very easy to do because most paywalled websites actually just include the, let's say you're trying to go to the New York Times, the full article is in the HTML, they just uh, don't render it. But if you ask ChatGPT to browse an article and then tell you the full text of the article, even if it's behind a paywall, it often would work. So they don't outright say that, but that's what people on Twitter are saying the problem is. Um, and they also allude to it when they say, if a user specifically asks for a URL's full text, it might inadvertently fulfill this request. So what this means is, right now, <laughs> everything in this section is currently disabled. And hopefully it's temporary because there's some pretty cool things in there. Uh, and I really enjoyed making this section. And I can only, I I'm pretty positive they're going to bring this back in some way because it really expands the possibilities of what ChatGPT can do if it's connected to the web. Right? It can tell me stock prices. It can read articles and summarize them to me. Uh, it, it can do all sorts of things that it normally can't do. I mean, it can tell me about the current features in React that it doesn't know about because they were released after its training cutoff. So hopefully it's temporary. They say it's temporary. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Next up, we're going to talk about web browsing with ChatGPT. Now, heads up here that this is a paid feature. It is not currently, at least, available to the free users. You have to pay for ChatGPT Plus in order to be able to use the web browsing and plugins features. 
So as we've discussed so far, uh, Jad GPT, well, GPT-4 had a training cutoff of some, what, September 2021, sometime in 2021, and it doesn't know about, it wasn't trained on any more recent information. So if I try to ask simple questions like, you know, who has the number one song on the billboard chart, or even just what is the number one song right now? It's going to tell me, I'm sorry, I can't tell you that I have a knowledge cutoff of September 2021. No surprise there. Now, this would be very simple to just Google, which is a whole separate conversation we'll have because a lot of the prompts that you'll see online, people talking about how to use ChatGPT with web browsing, a lot of them are just stupid because you could just Google the answer way faster. You'll find that ChatGPT with the web can be slow. But the first step here is actually to enable the web browsing tools. Um, if you have paid for ChatGPT+, you'll have GPT-4 as an option. And I've enabled a couple of different things where if you can see I hover, I have three choices. The default GPT-4, browse with Bing, which is the web browsing. They just actually renamed that. It used to say web browsing. Now it's branded for Bing. And then plugins. If you don't see those, but you do pay for ChatGPT+, Go to settings and under settings, there's a beta features. And here, there may be more features one day, but the two features you can turn on and off are browse with Bing, that's the web browsing version, and plugins. And we'll talk more about plugins in a little bit. So, this is the one for web browsing. Again, you won't see this if you don't pay for ChatGPT Plus as of right now. That definitely could change. The next thing you have to know is that it's not enough just to have that enabled, you then have to select it when you're creating a new chat. So I have that little icon up there of the web that tells me that I'm using the web browsing version, not the default, but the web browsing version. So now I can try the same thing. What is the number one song on the billboard charts right now? Now we wait. It tends to take a little while. It's not particularly quick because what it's doing is making a request it's loading that data, and then it's reading or parsing it, and then passing that off to the model. And here we go. The number one song in the Billboard Hot 100 chart right now is Last Night by Morgan Wallen. So this is just proof that it works. And I did verify that is the, the number one song right now. Not my favorite song personally, but it is the true number one song. It is accurate. So that's how we can use web browsing. Now I'm going to show you in the next couple of videos some examples of how it could be useful some example prompts that are better than, you know, something like this that I could easily Google. Okay, so now let's take a look at some other examples of web browsing, maybe something that can't be answered with a single Google search. So I'm going to try uh, something involving the stock market. I'll say, what three stocks uh, gained the most value today. And let's see what it does. You'll see that it's going to make an initial sort of search, top gaining stocks, May 24, 2023. It's going to click on a link. And then we wait while it loads the content and reads the content. Okay, so it finished there. Interesting, this is the one I was looking for. NVIDIA today had a, a huge jump in its price. Uh, AMD... Uh, again, I can verify if this is accurate. I don't know right now, but I will verify and double check before I actually share this with you. Uh, same thing with this answer here. Now, that was actually a pretty easy one. It looks like it found a single web page that just said top gaining stocks. So let's try something a little more interesting or a little more challenging. What about something like summarizing three news stories? So provide me or generate me summaries of today's top three news stories. And uh, in the real world, I would be way more specific. Are these US news, world news, uh, more output constraints? So maybe I'll say short summaries. Okay, so now it's gonna do a search for something, top news stories. And it may just find all of them at once. Let's see if it does. It clicked on one link. It's reading the content. Okay, it got all three at the same time. Ron DeSantis enters the presidential race. 
debt ceiling negotiations not going well, and anniversary of a mass shooting. Not the most uh, pleasant news. So let's try something significantly more complicated. I'm on the Hacker News Jobs Board. These are all Y Combinator startups, and these are recent job posts. What I want ChatGPT to do is, let's just make it easy by picking the first five, maybe, because it, it's slow if I tried to do it with every single one of these. I wanted to take the first five of these links, find the name of the company, so Aviator, Give Campus, Tesorio, Optory, Emerge Tools, and then find out how much money each of them has raised, and then compile that for me in uh, a table format, maybe. So what I need to do is just provide this URL. I could probably just say, go to the Hacker News Jobs Board, but just to be very specific, I will say, visit or browse the Hacker News, let's make this a bit larger, job board here. And then I'll say, extract the names of the first five companies who have posted on the board for each of the companies find out how much money they have raised and then maybe uh, return or output the data as a markdown table let's try this so while this is going it will take a while the next thing I want to call your attention to is that we can click here to view exactly what it's doing. So it went to this link and you can click this link, you know, make sure it's the right one. And it is the jobs board. And then it's reading the content. Now it's doing a search. We can see specifically for aviator funding. And then hopefully it's reading a post or some content. It found the amount. Now it's doing the same thing for give campus funding which is the second company on here, right? Aviator, Give Campus, Tesorio is the next one. And I'll be back when this finishes, but you can tell exactly what it's doing, or at least a, a general idea of what it's clicking on, what it's searching for. And here we go. So it's generating me this table, exactly what I asked for. It's pretty cool. And I don't know if it's entirely accurate. I did double check these first three. As far as I could tell, looking on Crunchbase, these numbers are accurate. Uh, for the sake of time, I didn't bother with these others. That is the limitation here is that it's searching the web, but it's only you know looking for the first matching result or hopefully the best matching result. It's unclear actually exactly what algorithm it uses when it searches for aviator funding. I assume we can click this link. I assume it just clicks the, well, the first non-advertisement link. So somewhere down here, or maybe it just grabs this number here. I don't know exactly what it does and how it decides once a search has been uh, executed. Either way, it's giving us numbers that are relatively accurate. As far as I can tell, these are the right numbers that I can find on the internet. That doesn't mean they're the true numbers, but they're the public numbers. So that's an example of something that took way more than just a single search. It visited a page, uh, a job board, it extracted the company names, and you know what might have been nice is actually to then have it also include, if I was doing this for real, you know, do it for every link on this page, include the funding, maybe the employee count, if I'm curious about that, and then a link to the specific job. And then I could have all that data here sort of compiled to make it easy for me to look at different companies. And maybe I want to work at companies that are new and don't have a ton of funding or a low employee count. So just kind of a fun example that shows that it is capable of far more complex things than just a single Bing search. With that said, there are limitations. As amazing as the web browsing can be when it works, it also is quite buggy currently and runs into a lot of issues. So here's an example uh, of a prompt. I asked it to summarize key findings of three recent articles on the journal Nature. Give its answer in Markdown. So it made its way to nature.com. It started reading some content and it went back and then it just started clicking on a whole bunch of different pages and sometimes the click fails. Sometimes it goes back, it, it gets very uh, confused or ends up in a rabbit hole where it clicks on a login button where it didn't need to do that. If we go to the original link right here, it could easily, in a perfect world, have clicked 
these three top links, right? Inverted per perovskite solar cells, author correction, author correction. Here's an example of one, right? It could just take this abstract and use that. Instead, it sometimes just kind of panics or gets in a loop and you'll see that this took uh, probably a minute or more and it actually ran out of time. So it time boxes itself and it says, I ran out of time to find a third. Here are the summaries for the first two. It basically times out. And it did summarize that first article. And here's another article that it summarized. And it tells me that it can continue searching to find a third one, but there's no way to easily have it do that. Once I click regenerate, it kind of resumes. Oh, and reading content failed. So the point of this video is to show you that it is not perfect. And it helps at times if you open up this trail, this drop down menu, to see where it's getting stuck. So for some reason, right, it keeps going back and then it's clicking on this link and then it can't read the content. Somehow it ends up here. It's just kind of going all over the place. So it's not perfect uh, and you need to watch it and what it's doing at times to understand why it's failing. One important thing to be aware of when using web browsing with uh, ChatGPT is that it has a time limit for how long it will take on any given request. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's not always consistent. It's around one minute of time. Sometimes it will go a little longer. Sometimes it cuts off before one minute. This means that we can't ask it to do monumental tasks like summarize every article on Wikipedia. Even if it could browse every article and theoretically summarize each one individually, ignoring the whole context window and <laughs> maximum number of tokens, there's also the time limit problem. So uh, we've already run up against this once, but let me demonstrate this. Let's say I want I wanted to browse two of my favorite music blogs. I don't have time to read music blogs anymore. Sadly, that's a little bit true. And I want it to tell me about five articles from each, summarize five articles. So visit the following music blog websites and generate a summary hmm, for five different articles from each website. And why don't we get fancy with the output? We'll say your output should be in markdown format. And then I'll specify the blogs, Pitchfork and Stereo Gum. So just two music websites. You can put whatever, you know, a subreddit in here or different Wikipedia pages or any blog that you read. And it will start. And I will start a timer here. So if we look at what it's done, it's gone to Pitchfork, it clicked on one article, a new Taylor Swift song, and it's presumably summarizing that. Then it went back, it clicked on another article. Oh no, here we go. Uh-oh, now it looks like it got stuck in a loop. This sometimes happens. Reading content failed. So this is eating up more of our precious time. Okay, it's thinking, going back, trying again. Oh, that's not good. And it's trying again. Okay, so now it found another article. It's summarizing that one. And it just gave me an output <laughs> that wasn't exactly what I asked for. I've completed summaries for four articles from Pitchfork. We've now hit a minute. And I have a feeling that's why it decided just to cut it short and give me the answer. Or give me some output. And then it turns red <laughs> when it finishes because uh, it didn't quite finish. And I guess it acknowledges that it didn't finish my request. I'm sorry I wasn't able to find the fifth. I'll now proceed to stereo gum. Nope, you won't because it's done. And I can ask it to regenerate, which I'll do. Although I actually am going to tweak my prompt a little bit to tell it uh, that I want it to give me a much shorter summary for each. Let's say something like each summary should be no longer than 50 words. So I'm gonna try this again and I'll just edit this out, but I'm gonna time it and see what happens this time. All right, so it's going, started a timer. So this time we hit a minute and 10 seconds and then it just decided it was done. 
and it starts the output. And this time it explicitly tells us, unfortunately, I ran out of time to find a fifth article from Pitchfork, let alone visit your second blog, Stereo Gum. So just more evidence that there is a time limit, although it, it is not hard coded at one minute, as far as I can tell, it's somewhere in that range. It's important to keep that in mind when you're writing prompts uh, with the web browsing model. <laughs> Next, let's talk a little bit about ChatGPT plugins. So plugins are available, um, currently at least, in ChatGPT Plus only. I imagine that's going to change, uh, but it's one of the settings that you need to toggle, just like we had to toggle the setting on to have web browsing available. There's a setting for plugins. And then if you wanna use plugins, you need to select plugins. And additionally, you then need to actually install plugins from the store. So what are plugins? They're basically like apps or integrations that work directly inside of ChatGPT. And right now it's very, very early in the, this, the development of plugins. There's a, a handful of them out there and some of them are useful. Some of them are kind of dumb toys. Uh, but if you go here, no plugins enabled, click, there is a plugin store that we can visit. And it doesn't look like there's that many when you load it. At least for now, it's showing me the popular ones. There's only, what, 10 or so that it's showing me. If you go to all, there's quite a few more. 17 pages for me right now. Now, I, I'm positive this will change. There'll be way more, although I've actually seen some plugins be removed from the store, uh, and the number has gone down. Uh, possibly some that snuck through the, or is it sneaked through the approval process and had something potentially malicious, who knows? But there's at least two I've seen that are no longer available. Anyway, you can see there's a bunch of different plugins uh, ranging from things like an Instacart plugin that you can ask about recipes, meal plans, and more, and then it gets cut off here, but you can use it to uh, actually place orders with Instacart. Or smaller things, let's just look at popular ones. Things like a kayak plugin where you can search flights and get real recommendations for actual flights directly within ChatGPT. Or a diagram generating plugin. Why don't we try that one? So if I want to use it, I have to click install. This one's called show me. I can go to installed and you'll see that it's been installed. You can also uh, uninstall it if you want to. And now I can select show me if that's what I want to use. The trick with plugins that I found that is a little difficult when you first install a new one and you don't know how it works is that there's no obvious documentation. So we can do something like, how does this plugin work? And it should respond to me with some documentation. The show me plugin is designed to create visual diagrams based on user requests. It uses a syntax called mermaid. Mermaid is a simple markup based language that's used to generate flowcharts. Here's how it works. Okay, so I have my request. Show me how a car engine works. Why don't we just try one of these examples? Uh, why don't we do draw me a mind map for, let's do cheese making. So again, I'm asking it how it works first. And then I'm gonna give it an actual prompt and let's see what it does. It's using the plugin as you can see right here. And if I expand this, it's showing me some of the requests that are being made behind the scenes. You really don't need to worry about that. I'm going to collapse it. And eventually, we will hopefully get a nice mind map about cheese making. And here we go. I'm getting the mind map. So it's giving me an explanation. But then we can see the map here. Cheese making is split into ingredients, process, and types. And this is still, you know, it's a very sl small mind map as far as the whole world of cheese making goes. Um, and what you can also do is edit this. So you can click this. It will take us to a diagram maker where we can then tweak it and add our own stuff in if we want to. So that's just our first example of a plugin. Very simple, but it shows the process. You have to go to the store, install a plugin, and then once you have installed it, you can use that plugin. And the, the most important first step is understanding how it works. Some of them are a lot more complex than others, but this is a pretty simple one to start with. Next up, I'm gonna show a few more examples of plugins that may or may not be all that useful. Uh, some of them are useful. 
there's no way for me to show all of the plugins that are available because even if I could, there's thousands of them right now and there's new plugins added pretty much every day. Thankfully, there's now a way to search through plugins, which there was not until recently. Uh, and the plugin that I'll be showing you in this video is called Ask Your PDF. And Ask Your PDF is one of many plugins that kind of add the same set of features to ChatGPT. There are many plugins that allow you to work with PDF documents. So if you have a research paper, a, a manual, I was playing around with this with the manual for my, I have a, a generator at home. I live actually, well, I don't know if I ever talked about this. I live off the grid and uh, I have a, a solar setup, but I have a, a backup generator and the generator is incredibly complicated and I hate reading the manual. So I was using the Ask Your PDF plugin to help me with the manual. And uh, it didn't change my life or anything, but it is kind of fun to provide documents that ChatGPT knows nothing about, like my generator manual or a research paper that was just published. And that's what I'm going to do here. I have this research paper that a friend sent me, 10 Steps to Complex Learning. It's not terribly long. It's 10 pages or so. Um, but I'm going to see if I can use Ask Your PDF to summarize this research paper. And then I can have a conversation with ChatGPT about this paper. So what I need to do is have a link to some PDF. I need to install the plugin, Ask Your PDF, which I've already done. And then I need to enable it in a chat session. So check that box. And then uh, like with any plugin, I can start with, you know, how does this plugin work? And it will tell me the different uh, features of the plugin, including, I presume, the ability to download and store a PDF. There we go. So we can provide a URL to a PDF document. It will validate the URL. Then it will download it. It will store it in a vector database. And then we can perform queries against that PDF. We can ask questions. So let's give it a shot. I'm going to tell it to download this PDF. And I have the URL to this research paper pasted right here. Now this is something ordinarily ChatGPT cannot do, right? There is no downloading of anything. It doesn't work with PDFs. This can take a little bit. We can see the plugin is working. It's thinking something is running. And one thing that's kind of frustrating with a lot of the plugins I've used is that they error out pretty frequently. So hopefully that doesn't happen here, although it has happened to me before with this particular plugin. Okay. It didn't. It said that it successfully downloaded the plugin or the PDF and it gives me a document ID and then it automatically starts by spitting out a summary. Um, I won't make you read this summary, but it's accurate. I have read this paper, so uh, I know that this summary is not bad. It discusses the 10 steps to complex learning, a modified version of the four component instructional design model aimed at developing educational and training programs. Okay. And now I can ask it specific questions. So here's a really simple one, like who wrote the research paper? And we wait and we wait kind of a long time because the process here is somewhat complex. It is having to go find this PDF that it downloaded and stored in a vector database. It uses something called embeddings that we're really not going to talk about, but eventually it retrieves the correct information. Paul Kirshner, and uh, I am totally going to butcher this name, this Dutch name. Let's verify, is that correct? And yes, it is. That was a simple enough question. And uh, I could, you know, ask it something about one of these sections, maybe ask it, what is, um, what does the paper say about comp compartmentalization? Mentalization. You get the picture, right? We're now able to work with documents that ChatGBT could not work with without this plugin. It is slow. It involves a bunch of requests and communicating with a, you know, a database. And it's not the smoothest process, but it is going to give me decent answers. And it's not perfect, but here we go. It's finding some key points where it mentions compartmental compartmentalization in the paper. So that's just one example of another plugin. I'll show a few more. Next up, we'll take a look at another plugin. Uh, this one has to do with YouTube videos. It's called Chat with Video, and it allows you to ask questions, analyze, and parse through YouTube videos simply by providing a YouTube URL. 
Um, I tried a few of these. There's a bunch of similar. You can see I've installed some video highlight and video insights. Um, and this one seemed to work the best, chat with video. It actually was quite impressive the first time I tried it, at least. So I have two different YouTube videos. Let's try this one. 21 awesome web features you're not using yet. I'm going to copy the URL and ask it to summarize this YouTube video. And let's see what it does. We wait. It is presumably trying to get a transcript. Okay. Here's a summary of the key points. And it may take a while, but these are different parts of the video. Let's verify if it's accurate. So native HTML dialogue, native popovers, web GPU. If I fast forward through here, in fact, we do have dialogue as one of the things it talks about. And the second point is popovers. So it seems like it's doing a pretty good job. Um, pretty nifty, honestly. I, I was impressed with it, and it, it doesn't take that long. Let's try one more. This is a review or a first impression of Apple's Vision Pro headset. And uh, in this video, I watched it earlier today. This reviewer talked about she was pretty impressed with it, although after like 15 minutes or so, it gave her red marks on her head and felt heavy, and she wasn't impressed with the battery life. And those are some of the key points I can remember. Let's try this one. What's this video about? And like I said, pretty quick. That is surprising to me. So it's a review of Apple's new mixed reality headset. Here's a summary of the key points. I mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty amazing, honestly. It says the headset is compared to a giant Apple Watch attached to the head. And one of the very first things she does in this video is comparing it to an Apple Watch <laughs> on her head. Um, so it's just using the transcripts. You know, she talks about everything that is summarized here it can actually watch the video and tell you what's happening in the video it's just based off of what is said but still it's pretty impressive and it even picked up on what i was saying that the reviewer mentioned it was comfortable for about 15 minutes and then the weight started to get noticeable um and yeah i mean it's pretty impressive so it will presumably have trouble with very long videos. I picked two on purpose that were eight minutes and five minutes. I haven't tried it with anything longer, but I would assume it, it would run out of space or context uh, and, you know, get cut off early. So that's a pretty impressive one. And uh, it's one I can at least recommend for now. And it works the best by far out of the handful of YouTube summarizing plugins that I played with. <laughs> Next, we'll take a look at the OpenTable plugin put out by OpenTable, which is a company, it's a website that helps you find and make restaurant reservations. And that's exactly what this plugin does. It helps you make, uh, well, it helps you at least find restaurants and reservations using OpenTable, but in a chat-based format. I don't show this necessarily because <laughs> you'll be making restaurant reservations all the time, but it's an example of a plugin put out by a company. So we'll also look at the Kayak plugin in the next video. It's a little bit different, um, but let's start with OpenTable. So to use OpenTable, of course, we can start with how does this plugin work, and it will tell us the different things that it can do. But it basically boils down to uh, it will tell us about restaurant reservations that are available in different cities, different times, meal types, occasions, the number of people in our party, uh, a search radius, latitude and longitude even. There's a whole bunch of different parameters. So let's say I'm trying to plan a birthday party for my sister who lives in New York City. Um, I need a reservation for, let's make it large, eight people in New York City on, and I'll say August, I don't know, 17th. And I could get specific about different types of food, but why don't I just start with this? So a reservation for eight people in New York City on August 17th. It's then going to query OpenTable's databases and give me some sort of response. Oh, more details about the type of restaurant. Okay. Let's say um, we want a very fancy restaurant. <laughs> I don't know if that's specific enough. Let's see if it can handle very fancy <laughs> as our query. Okay, 
So here are some fancy restaurants where you can make a reservation for eight people on August 17th. And then it gives me a link. You can see it's using markdown format. So here's one of the restaurants it suggested based on these links, Cafe Del Sas. And then I can make my reservation. Eight people, I guess it's already sort of pre-filled out for me. Anyway, I don't know if I would use this all that often, but it is just another example of uh, a plugin. In this case, it's a plugin put out by a specific company to help you connect to their product. In the next video, we'll take a look at another example similar to this one, but it's a little more complex because it actually requires some authentication. All of the plugins that we've used so far haven't required two-factor authentication to be enabled, but some of the plugins in the store do require two-factor auth. One example of this, uh, if I go to the store and I go to the popular plugins, one example would be, where are you? Notable, right here. This is a plugin that helps us make Python and different coding notebooks, which if you're not a developer, it doesn't matter. I'm just showing this as an example here. It will tell me you need to enable two-factor authentication. And you only have to do this one time, but I haven't done it yet on this account. So I'll go ahead and do that now. Enable two-factor auth. And then I'll have to sign back in. And then it's going to give me a QR code. And I'll scan this using my Authenticator app on my phone. Or just any uh, camera app will open the link. Okay, that opens in Authenticator. And then it gives me my code in the Authenticator app. Just a one-time code, so I guess I'll show it to you. And then it takes me back to chat. And let's see, did that install it? No, I now have to go and install it separately. So now I can install plugins like Notable, which I will just briefly do here. Okay, so now we see something completely different. When I install a plugin that requires authentication, we then will authenticate with the actual application or the provider, in this case, Notable. So I'll create an account with my GitHub login. I'll authorize the application. And eventually. And now it's installed. As you can see here, it's enabled. Let's see. How do I use this plugin? So there's a handful of these plugins that require us to authenticate. And basically, it's any plugin that integrates with a third-party application where you would need an account to use that application. So we don't need an account to search on OpenTable, for example. Um, but if we wanted to, and I'm sure there are plugins that do this, uh, that will actually, I don't know, create or allow you to purchase products. So let's see how this works. We can create a new project, a notable project from directly within here. I can create a new notebook. Uh, I'll just do a quick demo. Create a new notebook. Okay, so it made me a new notebook, and then it gives me the link. So this is an interactive Python notebook, a Jupyter notebook. Again, not at all important if you're not familiar with those concepts, but hopefully you can see this is creating something off the platform. Right? This is creating a notebook on this notable website. It's giving me a tutorial, um, and that's all that I'll show about this particular plugin. The point of this video is more about enabling two-factor auth for certain plugins that require it. Thank you.